So I was, I was going to have a fairly informal session around sort of the role of IPPs in Asia. And I think both, um, we have two panelists here that can provide very unique and interesting perspectives. I think Stein can obviously provide a perspective around sort of the global um, perspective that he has at Aon in terms of IPPs and what he sees in Europe, Asia, and, and the Americas. And Jamie can provide kind of what, it, I'm from more micro example of what an IPP struggles with and has the opportunity to do in, in the Philippines. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and then we're gonna have kind of a back and forth and then we'll open it up to Q&A in about 30 minutes. Hi, uh, good morning. I'm uh, Jaime Azurin uh, from uh, Global Business Power Corporation in the Philippines. Uh, we are a power generating company, an independent power producer uh, of about uh, 600 well, more than 600 megawatts uh, in the Philippines and uh, currently in development, an additional 230 megawatts and a lot of other uh, renewable energy projects uh, in the pipeline. We have been operating for the last uh, 10 years and uh, since the uh, renewable, uh, the uh, Industry Reform Act of 2001 was uh, promulgated by the Philippine government in 2001. My name is uh, Stein Dahle. I'm a uh, senior vice president of EON, uh, working in the fields of corporate strategy, uh, corporate development, and international markets. A uh, few highlights on the EON, uh, probably one of the largest uh, privately held uh, utilities in the world, uh, approximately 150, 160 billion US dollars of turnover last year. Uh, about 60 gigawatts in operation, uh, 60,000 people. Um, predominantly focused in Europe, but outside of Europe, we are a large investor into, uh, into Russia, into Turkey, uh, in the United States, and also in Brazil. Great. Um, Stein, I wanted to start with you, because the power business ends up being very local business, driven by regulation, access to capital, and feedstock. But given your role, are you seeing any mega trends that kind of transcend geography and, and local markets in terms of um, the IPP business? What, what we see is obviously, and that goes, I think, in every country that I have been, uh, is that uh, the power markets lives in the intersection of politics and regulation, uh, capital markets, technology, and also the power markets or feedstock markets. and. Uh, and lately we've seen in Europe, and I, I think that goes for a number of other countries as well, um, lack of regulatory visibility, uh, some uh, retroactive changes and, and changes in, in the environment for investors, which are a concern. I think that hampers the, the, uh, the investor trust in certain markets, and uh, this is one of the problems that we see. Is that true in, from that macro, or is that also playing out in the Philippines, or...? Well, uh, in the Philippines, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, started the uh, Industry Reform Act of 2001. And after uh, 12 long years, we're still uh, struggling as far as the going to the last stage, which is the open access, no? wherein all consumers will be allowed to choose their own generators. But uh, in the Philippine case is that, of course, we started with the unbundling of rates. After that, we had to privatize all of government's assets. About more than 70% have been uh, privatized already. And the introduction of the IPPs, you know, wherein there will be open competition, the introduction of the spot market. And uh, right now, we're doing now, hopefully, the final stage of open access. As, as you're going through this regulatory transition in the Philippines, how are you looking at uh, development? Like what, what sort of projects are you looking at? Are you looking at mainly renewables? Are you looking at... Well, you know, uh, the Philippines, we started with the uh, fossil fuels. So we're into a coal and bunker because at that time, when we started our business you know, 10 years ago, is that there was a lack of supply. So what, we, the, the, what our company did was to establish first basically the requirements of our country. And uh, after that, uh, right now we are already going into the renewables, especially after the passage of the feed-in tariff, 
we are developing uh, different renewable projects in hydro, uh, biomass, as well as uh, geothermal. In terms of how, what's the growth strategy for Aon in terms of how you're thinking about development, not just in Asia, but, but, but globally? Can you say again, please? What's your growth strategy? We talked, I think you've had a large exposure to the U.S. wind market. You're looking at solar. How are you guys thinking about growth? I think uh, you mentioned, first of all, some of the trends that you see. I think uh, um, renewables is a mega trend. Uh, I think that uh, also security of supply for a number of countries are of uh, paramount importance. And finally, affordability for the consumers. So if you think around this triangle, um, you have to find a value proposition that fits within those. Um, we started in the, you know, really through a separate vehicle, 100% owned vehicle, to develop renewables in the, from 2007. Uh, today we have about five gigawatts of renewables, uh, and this is outside hydro, hydro, so predominantly in wind and some solar, uh, both offshore and onshore wind. Uh, we see that the wind market will continue. We see also that uh, that the PV market, solar market, will continue. I think these. Um, Technologies offers opportunities on the global uh, arena. I think also that for some of these emerging markets that we, we observe, still the need for both um, thermal power in terms of coal-fired and gas-fired is still there and needs to be covered. Um, we have a small office here in Singapore doing origination and, um, and trading in, in fuels, so in coal, freight and LNG trying to cooperate with, the, with local partners that need that kind of, ser of, of services. So we see, we see growth in the renewable space, we see growth in, in, in the global trade around LNG coal, and uh, for us it's about establishing platforms. When we go outside of, of what we define as our home markets, typically we do that with partners. So together with partners, finding renewable opportunities, but still also be able to offer on our knowledge within uh, the thermal uh, spectrum, I think is, um, is the way forward for us. Is one of, one of the reasons you have a small presence in Asia to date is how, how are you viewing Asia within your overall strategy? Is it not as high of a priority right now or is it something that you want to invest in in the future? Uh, obviously, uh, uh, Asia is an important market uh, in, in all different aspects. What we have done, obviously, is to focus on Europe, uh, looking at the different European countries that we have invested in. On the backside of the financial crisis, there have been challenges in these markets. Uh, we took then also the opportunity to invest in renewables, more on the global scale. Um, when you step outside, you need to focus. You need to be able to execute and deliver on your promises. So, so we take one step at a time. Uh, but uh, definitely we see Asia and, and Southeast Asia as a promising market, yes. And Jaime, you, you talked about you have shareholders that are both domestic and international, um, particularly you have a, and Japanese. How are they viewing the Philippines in the context of other markets in Asia? Obviously, they're present in multiple um, Asian markets. How, are they, how do they contextualize the Philippines? Well, uh, they have always seen the Philippines as a uh, growing market, no? And um, with the advanced uh, formulation of regulatory as far as a feed-in tariff are concerned, that's why we are seeing more in, uh, foreign investors uh, coming into the Philippines. No? And the, for these new technologies like solar, the wind, and, and, and other uh, renewable energy, is that for our companies that we look for strategic technical partners, no? We have uh, right now Oryx of Japan, who's very, very uh, strong as far as renewable energy, biomass, bagas projects uh, in the region. No? So we're banking on them to help us develop basically the, uh, the bagas or biomass project in the Philippines. For wind and solar, uh, of course, we're still on the lookout for strategic and uh, technical partners before we go into this field. When you, when you talk about renewables and sort of the role of the grid, and, and we talked about this in the past, as renewable scales obviously presents challenges in the grid, and, in the grid, and we've seen that in, in, in Europe and we've seen that in parts of the U.S., how is the Fil Philippines going to be able to handle you know, more wind and solar coming on stream? 
You know, what's the, uh, you know, renewable uh, projects, they come in and out of the grid. You know, in technical terms, it's very, very difficult to have a, uh, a very big renewable project that is tied up to the grid because they come in and out, no? And uh, for technical reasons, you still have to support it with some other, you know, uh, fossil fuels like natural gas or, or, or coal to be able to uh, stabilize the whole grid. So uh, the growth of renewable in, the, in our country basically we all will have to be supported by the growth of other fossil fuels too. How are you seeing that play out in Europe? Um, well, I can give you one example. In, in Germany, which is not the sunniest country in the world, we have a lot of solar PV, rooftop PV and wind, which has been built on the backside of incentives and subsidies. So on a solely and windy day in Germany, more than half of the energy consumption of Germany can be covered by renewables, which is very positive. On the flip side of that, you will also see um, periods actually with negative power prices because there is an oversupply and the ability to ramp up and ramp down is not quick enough. So we've seen hours with negative power prices and uh, uh, as mentioned here, you also have to have the backup capacity for a rainy and not so windy day. And obviously the cost of having this reserve capacity needs to be carried by uh, the consumers. And uh, I think this is some of the, the challenges that you will see in a transition period um, when new technology can come in and, and cope with that kind of variations. Uh, we need that technology to be developed further. It is obviously also a lot of stress on the networks, on the distribution networks. The, the number of interferences have skyrocketed on the backside of renewables. So you need to have a total system understanding to be able to manage that. It is challenging, but I think it is the right way to go. One of the things that, that we always struggle with as a private equity investor is with renewables in particular is around how capital markets view it. And I think it's evolved. I think right now, you, you, one of the issues with renewables has been a lack of scale. And so for an IPP, should you do one 500 megawatt project or do 20? Um, and there's an operational issues with that. How are you guys looking at that from, because from, you're obviously publicly listed, you're dealing with investors that, do they want scale or do they want a better balance within, you know, from a feedstock or, or how, how are they thinking about you as a, sort of a publicly listed company? Well, if you look at the investment in the renewable sector, it depends on what kind of contracts you do and how, how you structure it. So you can have a longer-term PPAs, and these differ. Uh, if you go to the to UK, you will see for offshore wind, you will see rock certificates. Uh, in the United States, you can have tax incentives and longer-term PPA. Uh, in, the, uh, in Germany, you can have feed-in tariffs. So if you look at the flip side of this, it's about credit risk. Okay, so how you invest into different kind of credit risk. If you go with a long-term PPA with a customer, there is a spillover of the, uh, of the cost of on the risk and your cost of capital. So uh, whether you would like to do a big or a small project depends on the total structure of, of your project. Um, today you see, um, I think recently there were announced uh, solar PV deals in Texas at about 5 US cents uh, kilowatt, which is pretty much low. And, and I think that the cost of solar panels still will improve and, uh, and technology will allow uh, both smaller and bigger projects to be developed. But all depending on the totality of, of how you actually manage to build together your project. How do you look at sort of execution risk? Would you prefer to have one 500 megawatt project that takes longer to implement or 20 from an operational construction risk, sort of just doability perspective? Well, of course, uh, the bigger the scale, the better, no? Because uh, in project development, uh, as we have uh, experienced all the project developers, whether it's 20, 500, 100, you know, the the, the process remains the same. The, the, the raising of capital, the uh, location, the uh, permits, everything that uh, passes through, whether it's small or big. No? So, of course, uh, on our end, it's better to be, have bigger. However, in the Philippines, yeah, we are a small country, 
and uh, we can only develop very small projects. And uh, as uh, presented a while ago, there are caps for every renewable project. So uh, you have to be able to come in uh, and hopefully uh, be part of that cap, no? Because uh, the feed-in tariff in the in the Philippines, uh, you know, the priority dispatch is very very important. Uh, especially with an open market, we have a spot market in the Philippines, wherein if you have priority dispatch, as long as you are there, even though what price it is, then you are you are called upon, and uh, that is key to any renewable project because they come in and out. So uh, for us, because there should be a on our end, we are heavy on fossil fuels, and uh, it there will come a time looking forward ten years from now is that renewable will be a very big market in the Philippines. So we are also diversifying diversifying ourselves so that to be able to uh, you know um, invest as early as now into renewable projects. Just moving the topic along to access to capital, which is obviously core to the IPP business. How, 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 when you go for credit and for equity in the Philippines, obviously there's a, a perception around the Philippines, they have to both positive and negative, they have to manage this also project by project. How are particularly lenders viewing sort of a coal project versus a solar or wind or hydro project in terms of how are they approaching that from a cost of capital perspective? Well, uh, luckily in the Philippines right now, our cost of capital is very low. For a 10-year uh, money, you can b borrow as low as about 7% as compared to other uh, countries. No? So as far as capital is concerned, we have uh, in the Philippines. And for the technology, I'm, I guess you know, uh, wind and, and solar is an acceptable technology worldwide. And for local uh, capital, uh, it's just choosing the right uh, maybe a supplier to be able to put up this, this uh, renewable energy for you. And with the feed-in tariff, you are already guaranteed of the rate. So it's easy for local banks or for in, even for international banks to be able to see you know, your revenue streams. So the, are the lenders discount? Because you know, in Europe, you've had some issues around resets and, and some wobble around feed-in tariffs. Is that happening in, with lenders in the Philippines, or are they pretty much assuming this will continue? Well, I guess it's premature to say. You know, we, are, we have just started uh, the uh, feed-in tariff, and uh, by law, it's going to be fixed. So uh, hopefully, if, if the law doesn't change, then uh, those who come in early, I would presume, will have the higher tariffs. For the next phase, I would presume, because of advancement in technology, it will become lower and lower as, as years goes by. What about for my more global access to credit? Um, how, are you seeing any trends? Because what we see is the solar industry, obviously the cost of capital seems to be getting cheaper despite all these other uncertainties. Are you seeing a similar trend or...? or? Um, a number of different countries offer different kind of, uh, of uh, financing schemes. I mean, uh, you see uh, um, yeah national development banks together with IFC in different structures on the renewable side. Uh, you see a number of different international players uh, offering different, uh, different opportunities and financing structures. When it comes to technology, I think that the, the important part is, is again to, to assess the project risk, to assess the PPA, and, 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 uh, and that is uh, the prevailing issue that they will be uh, concerned about uh, as investors or as lenders into projects. And obviously, the um, the track record of of the company doing it, so your ability to execute on time, on cost, and 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 uh, that you have the knowledge necessary to to be able to deliver this. So um, obviously, some some money in emerging markets are more uh, liquid, if you can put it this way. So what you've seen in the United States probably drawn a lot of liquidity back to the U.S. Um, certain certain projects then suffering from lack of international capital. FX is an issue uh, in the global markets, so concerns around, um, we'll take some of the markets that we are in, um, the deterioration of Turkish lira versus uh, US dollars or euro, the, the Russian rubles or the Brazilian reais. I mean, FX issues will be a concern for international investors. You know, interesting, one of the things you had mentioned in the past was um, 20 years ago, developing power projects was a little bit more predictable. And now, 
uh, now it's much less predictable, particularly around, there's so many changes on the regulatory side, so many changes on the feedstock and technology side. But one of the things you did mention was power sort of the intersection of policy and politics. How do you get predictability or, or you know, in, in, for example, feedstock, you can take a view on nat gas, you can take a view on solar technology pricing. How do you take a view on political risk um, when, when, in, in a market? I mean, how are, you, how are you diligencing that or how do you approach it? Oh, that's a good question. I think if you talk to a number of CEOs and they look back, they would say that I should have invested more in understanding politics. Uh, the question is, would you have understood the politics? Uh, it's obviously a big question. I think, uh, obviously, to, if you are a system-relevant player and you, you have uh, a capability to offer, I think that uh, there is a symbiotic relationship between the policy, uh, policy makers, the politicians, the regulator, and the, and the utilities, because they, they are dependent on each other. So when you talk about visibility, yes, I think in the past you would look at the oil price and the oil price and the oil price, and you can derive a lot of things from that. Today it is much more complex. You see um, solar panels playing a role, uh, um, wind power coming more into the markets, and, uh, and other renewable technologies. So it's getting more and more complicated, which means also that the visibility on the backside of of difficulties in financial markets and the, um, the volatility in feedstocks, um, shale gas boom in the United States, etc. So the visibility is, is getting shorter, which is uh, to some extent um, limiting investments in larger projects. So I think uh, what was also mentioned earlier today on this stage was that, you know, maybe smaller projects will be the prevailing ones because the, the mega projects will be difficult. Yeah, I mean, that's a trend we see sort of. The capital markets are one who would love to see scale because that allows them to underwrite assets. And it, it takes the same amount of work to do a 500 megawatt project as a 5 megawatt project. Um, however, um, what is the business model that, that you see going forward? Is it going to be a lot more distributed and, and sort of smaller projects in the Philippines? Or is it going to be... You know how how are you going to met, how are you going to allocate development dollars in terms of um, what projects you're trying to develop in the future? Well, uh, you know we the policy of government is uh, open access. That means open competition. So the lower the rate, the better. So uh, for any uh, company uh, in the Philippines who's doing business in power generation, uh, of course all the strategies are pointing efficiency where we can get uh, more efficient power reliable at the cost competitive uh, basis now because open access is just uh, around the corner in our country and you know at the end of the day it's basically what is your price vis-a-vis -vis the other price so uh, as far as we're concerned is that uh, we have to operate our plant very efficiently at the least cost possible and how do you see the role of distributed power generation within your business model? Well, distributive, uh, well, they, they are starting also distributive power in the Philippines, no? the, the net metering system, as I mentioned earlier. Um, that depends, no? because uh, while it's good to have a, a, a PV panel on, on top of your roof, you know, but uh, still, you know, it's expensive you know, for, for Philippine standards. So it depends really on how many uh, investors will be willing and how much is the cost to put up this uh, PV, PV, uh, PV on your roof. No? So uh, as far as uh, you know, where it's going, well, the, Philippi the government has laid down the framework and now it's upon the investors, individuals, corporate, the like, to uh, seek its own, you know, where, where the path is going. No? As far as we're concerned, is that we are moving towards uh, uh, embedded generation so that you are closer to the market and you have a captive market as well as balancing your uh, client base to industrials to uh, commercial and residential and that's the only way that you will be able to run an efficient power plant at the same time uh, and also uh, get the returns that you have uh, projected in the first place. When, you, when you're executing or in construction on projects, are, 
smaller or, or renewal projects easier to execute from a permitting, land acquisition, relations with the community versus, is, is, that, is that easier or, or is this the same as bunker and coal? Well, uh, you know, uh, we started with bunker and then we shifted to coal. And uh, coal has a negative connotation to all the minds of the people, maybe even here. You know, uh, they, they look at uh, the uh, technology as uh, still not clean. No? Although, um, we, when we started, we developed this, what we call the clean coal technology. In fact, it's a byword in the Philippines. No? A clean coal technology says that uh, it's not that we have eliminated all the, uh, the uh, sulfur oxide, nitrogen oxide, you know, which pollutes the air, but we have reduced it substantially through advancement in technology. Now, for renewables, it's easy. Why? Because uh, it has less uh, problem for community acceptance. You know, in, in our countries that you have to get community acceptance as one of uh, the uh, permits that you, you have to undertake before you can implement a project. How are you viewing clean coal? Because we, we see a lot of technology as well coming through in China, in the US, and, and other markets. How, do you guys have a view on, on clean coal or, 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 or sort of a view, or even coal as a feedstock for you? I think um, from, we have obviously a steam fleet and, uh, and for us uh, it goes the same. It's uh, to operate it as efficient as possible. Um, and, um, and on the other side, when you see, at least in the European context, uh, you don't see too many coal projects uh, on, uh, you know, surfacing in any way, and uh, and uh, and the challenge right now is uh, obviously that if you want to do a project like that, uh, the environmental approvals, the uh, the local acceptance, etc., will will be um, challenging for you. So uh, I think. Um, for, uh, but if you look at some of these emerging markets uh, and also in, in, in Asia, you, will, you need also to understand that the most expensive energy is the one that you don't have. Because if you want to develop and have uh, economic growth, you need to develop your energy system. And um, so there is a trade-off between, uh, between the interest of economic growth and, and also looking at the environment. So I believe when you raise the question, do you want do we, do you see distributed energy solutions? Yes, I think you will see renewables coming more and more into the market. Uh, will they be dominant? Not for a long time. But uh, I think that you need to develop, and you can develop a view where the total system costs of of developing the infrastructure and uh, and uh, the needs for investments into distribution networks, etc., can be looked upon in a different way. Also, when you the distributed energy solutions, battery technology might be developed in the next five years, which can change that game totally. How do you um, benchmark yourself as, as you know, are you looking at larger utility companies and sort of benchmarking, because that's how the capital markets tend to look at you, or how are you sort of thinking about the business model of utility with renewables, with distributed, with, how, how are you thinking about your business model, say five, 10 years from now, sort of someone in strategy at a, a large utility. Yeah, the uh, forward-looking statements I would <laughs> make here right now. Uh, so, but uh, when you ask, how do we uh, do we benchmark ourselves? Yes, we do benchmark ourselves obviously against other utilities. Uh, but I think more importantly, uh, we do benchmarking on our effectiveness, how how uh, our capabilities in operating different uh, different platforms, being that our gas fleet, steam fleet how we are able to execute on wind projects, solar, etc. So we need to be really um, good in what we do. And to be able to understand how good you are, you need to benchmark yourself against the best competitors. We are a demand management and uh, RE portfolio development company. <clears throat> uh, my question is to Stain. Uh, RE intermittency on the grid and stability and the matter that <clears throat> was significant impact on the <clears throat> RE integration uh, for the grid stability regions, how is uh, since Germany has a significant penetration of RE, <coughs> RE uh, how this intermittency issue has been uh, managed in the overall grid stability issue? I think it's, the question about is about grid stability. Yeah, grid stability basically on the RE integration uh, with the backup solutions like a batteries or any other op applications. 
So as renewables becomes more part of the, the, the generation mix, how are you thinking about grid stability, things like backup power, et cetera? Well, the, um, I think the, the importance of understanding the investment needed into the grid is to some extent underestimated. Uh, if I take uh, one of the research we've done in, in Germany, we've seen that the interference into distribution companies has gone from, uh, let's say, a level of uh, 10 a month to 120 a month. Uh, so, so it shows clearly the cost of, and the complexity of running distribution uh, systems when you get more renewables in, so more intermittents. Um, so you need to, uh, to have uh, a capability of understanding the total system to be able to execute it. Um, so uh, I think that um, over time, obviously, the, um, there might be battery solutions, but as I said, you know, I don't know if I, you see them the next five or ten years, it's hard to say depends on the technology. Maybe the, uh, the e-mobility would be part of developing the battery technology. Um, when it comes to reserve capacity, obviously there is no hidden money. So, so uh, some of the discussions you will have in a European context is who's going to carry that cost. And uh, currently we are actually mothballing a lot of uh, gas-fired power capacity due to a lack of, uh, of, um, yeah, of returns on this. The, 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 the spark spread is, is not there for these investments and uh, they are mothballed or, or taken out of the system. And this is a challenge uh, at the end of the day for the total system and for the, for the, um, also for the investor, investors. When it comes to the politics of that, obviously politicians are concerned about the system but politicians need also to be concerned about investors, so there needs to be a fine balance here. I think we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you so much for participating in the panel. The take what I took away from this was there's a lack of predictability that may have happened historically in IVPs, but that presents both opportunities and challenges.